So today we're going to be starting with 4.5. Um, 4.5 just looks at another type of reaction. So, so far we've looked at different types of reactions, uh, chemical reactions, for example, synthesis reactions, decomposition reactions. Um, we've looked at acid metal reactions. Specifically, we've looked at neutralization, acid metal um, carbonates, acid metal reactions, all that kind of stuff. So what we're going to be doing today is we're going to be adding another type of chemical reaction to that list. And that is a chemical reaction known as a uh, precipitation reaction. Okay, so precipitation reactions are what we're going to focus on today. So we're going to look at what precipitation reactions are. We're going to watch two videos that show you how precipitates are formed. Because remember, the formation of a precipitate or precipitate is basically the main characteristic of precipitation reactions. Well, I don't know why there's an S there. Um, so yeah, that's the basic um, idea that we're going to be doing today. Okay, so precipitation reactions are basically reactions that lead to one of the products being an insoluble solid. Um, can anyone take a guess as to what the word insoluble means? And if you know, just put it in the chat box. Just give it a try. Excellent, not able to dissolve in water. Excellent. So what we see in precipitation reactions is that we've got two um, two compounds that do dissolve in water or two ionic solutions represented as A, B and C, D here. And we'll look at some real examples in the next few slides. But this is the formula we use for precipitation reactions. Okay, so I'll just write that formula there. Yeah. And so basically what we find in a precipitation reaction is that every single compound in that reaction is dissolved in solution. Okay, and usually that solution is water. That's why it's aqueous, aqueous relating to water. Okay. Um, aqueous means dissolved in solution. So every single um, substance in that reaction is dissolved in water except one product. And that product is, as you can see here, S stands for solid. This is the insoluble solid in this chemical reaction or in this chemical equation here. Okay, insoluble solid. The simple word that we give for insoluble solid is the precipitate. So if we ever ask you, for example, to watch a video and then to um, identify what the precipitate is, you're going to be looking at what forms when two solutions are mixed together, what forms in that test tube or what forms in that beaker that doesn't just dissolve, that doesn't just lead to a clear solution, but is like cloudy or there's like a jelly-like substance forming in there. Okay, so that's what the precipitate is. And I'll show you guys a few videos to make that easier to visualize. Um, so I've already talked about in a water aqueous solution. Yep, they are separate. Um, this is just, guys, this information is just literally explaining the uh, formula here. Okay, the basic idea being that every substance, almost every substance except one is dissolved or soluble, or sorry, is dissolved in water. That's what we call as the aqueous, okay? But the uh, precipitate is the only uh, insoluble one, okay? And that's why it takes on a, solid state of matter okay solid state of matter being that it does not dissolve in water it stays behind in the test tube or in the beaker as a solid kind of substance there okay so another word for um, precipitation reaction is double displacement reaction the reason we sometimes call precipitation reactions double displacement is that the substrates kind of change or displace their partners so basically in order to form the precipitate which is represented as ad here there is uh, basically we take the A and then we take the D and those two substances will form the precipitate there. Okay, this doesn't make sense when we're just looking at the formula, but I'll show you guys a real example with actual substances um, in a bit. Okay, so that's the basic idea and that's what double displacement means, that both the substrates change or displace their partners there. So AB no longer becomes AB, it becomes AD and CD becomes CB. That's what um, substrates changing or displacing means. Okay, so let's move on so we can look at some real examples. In fact, we'll come back to this. I just want to show you guys a real, okay, this is the example from your book. Okay, so if we, if we apply that same formula, and I have to write it again on this slide. So this formula was AB is aqueous, okay, which means that substance AB will be uh, dissolved in solution, plus CD, which is also aqueous, leads to, oh, I don't know if I'll fit this now. Okay, AD, which is a solid, um, plus CB, 
which is aqueous. Okay, that's the idea. And the one that I'm going to circle now in purple is our precipitate that's formed. We know that because that's the only solid. If we ever give you a formula that looks something like this, at first that might seem really overwhelming, but just look at the states. If we ask you what type of formula is this, if you can say, okay, aqueous, 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 and there's only one solid in there, automatically for sure 100%, this is a type of precipitation reaction, okay? So just look for the states of matter. If it's all aqueous and there's just one solid there, that is most likely a precipitation reaction. That just makes it easier for you to identify it in a test or SAC situation there. Okay, so anyway, let's apply our um, formula now of precipitation reactions to this formula. This is the worded formula with words. Okay, and this is the chemical formula that uses actual chemical symbols, chemical. Okay, so the worded formula is lead to nitrate. Does anyone remember what does the um, Roman numerals in the brackets, what does that represent or suggest? If anyone can remember, just put it in the chat box or even have a guess. Okay, remember guys, when we said some of our transition metals, which are in, um, you know, in the middle part of the periodic table there, sometimes a lot of them have what we call as a variable valency or a variable charge. What that means is they don't have a set charge. For example, we say sodium is in group one, so sodium has a plus one charge, yeah? But some of those metals, the transition metals in the periodic table don't have a set charge, okay? When we write lead two in brackets, what that means is that lead, which, has a chemical symbol PB, has a two plus charge in this situation for this question, okay? Whatever the Roman numeral is in brackets, it will have this, that specific number as its charge for that question, okay, if that makes sense. So that's the basic idea. So lead two nitrate plus potassium iodide. Again, these are both aqueous solutions according to our formula. Lead nitrate in this case will be um, AB, and the CD will be potassium iodide, okay? Now, what comes after that is going to be our, is going to be our um, precipitate and our other aqueous solution. So our precipitate is AD, which take a guess guys, by matching the formula to the equation we have here, which substance do you think, or which product do you think forms the precipitate here? Just looking at that formula, interpreting it, looking at the states, is it lead iodide or is it potassium nitrate that will become the precipitate here? Okay, I'll ask again. So when we've got lead iodide and potassium nitrate, which one is going to become the precipitate? as in which one is going to become the substance that remains behind in the equation as a solid insoluble substance there that doesn't dissolve and that is not aqueous. Come on, it's just a matter of looking at the equation. Yeah, excellent, lead, yeah, lead iodide is going to be our um, solid there, okay? In that case, it's going to become our AD and obviously CB, which is the last part of our formula becomes potassium nitrate. So out of these, the only one that is um, the only one that is insoluble that will remain behind as a solid is lead iodide. That is our precipitate. Okay, that's the worded equation. Okay, we always give you the worded equation, or there'll be enough information in the scenario for you to write that up yourself. We're not going to ask you to make up or create one of these equations. Okay, you'll always be given information to write it up or you will be given that direct e uh, worded equation and then asked, okay, this is the worded equation, write the chemical formula for the worded equation, something like that. Okay, so this is now the chemical equation that we're looking at here with all the chemical symbols, okay? Um, this is all to do with basically how we write chemical symbols. We know lead nitrate, lead has a charge of two plus. Okay, hold on, I need a bit of space here. So if lead has a charge of two plus, which we know because of that Roman numeral two bracket, and nitrate, if you look into your valency table, can anyone remember off the top of their head, what, what is the charge for nitrate? Or just take a guess based on the formula there. What is the charge for nitrate? If 
come on guys the charge for nitrate is minus minus one or negative one okay we know that because if we look into our balancey table which we always give you in the test situation or exam situation that's given to you there nitrate this is the formula that's it okay so now we know that nitrate and you notice here guys one of the definitions that we said for precipitation reaction was that it always involves two ionic um substances combining together this is an ionic uh solution that forms because lead was positive to begin with and nitrate was negative to begin with and so they're oppositely charged and that's what an ionic equation or ionic um substance is yeah an ionic compound or an ionic solution is basically two oppositely charged substances that are combining together Okay, anyway, so when we do our little switcheroo, little swapping of charges thing, crisscross, whatever you want to call it, um, PB will take on the charge number associated with the charge of nitrate, which in this case is negative imaginary one. So we put a one there, it doesn't need to be there, but just for the purpose of the example. And obviously with nitrate, it's going to take on the number two, but we don't just write that like this, that's wrong. What we need to do is we need to put a bracket around the whole nitrate like that and then put the two on the outside. Okay, because this is a polyatomic ion and with polyatomic ions, we always have to put a bracket around them before we put the subscript. Okay, that's just the rule. Um, so that's how we got the formula there. And we know that's an aqueous solution because this is an ionic um, ionic kind of uh, interactional bonding that we see there. So I, it's an aqueous solution that will be formed. Okay, and then we've got potassium iodide. Okay, which is basically Ki and then there's been some balancing that has taken place here. Uh, that's why the two coefficient is there. And then that leads to the products of lead iodide, so PBI2 plus 2KNO3, which is potassium nitrate. Okay, again, some balancing has taken place. That's why we see the coefficient there. So this is basically the full, let me write that down in. Let me type that up. That's easier. This is what we call as the full balanced chemical equation with states. In tests and exam questions, if we expect you to write a full equation like this, this is what we'll ask you, a full balanced chemical equation with states. So first you write up the chemical equation using what formulas you know, and then you look at the number of atoms on each side. Is it equal? And if it's not equal, you put your coefficients in. Okay, as we can see here, we've got some two coefficients, a two in front of the potassium iodide and a two in front of the potassium nitrate there. So that's how this equation has been balanced in this situation. You might be thinking, oh my God, that's going to take me a million years on the sack. And this is why you guys need to practice, okay? Balancing equations. One of the hardest things about chemistry isn't the individual things that we do. It's the fact that we take those individual things and we need to bring everything together to solve like one question that's worth like two marks or something. Okay, that's the hard bit. So being able to think on your feet, just knowing things like off the top of your head that nitrate has a negative one charge, save you, saves you a minute or two from having to flip back to your balancey table and search that up again. Okay, so it's just a matter of making sure you're able to combine that knowledge there. Anyway, so this is the full balanced chemical equation, just following the formula that we talked about before. Okay, the AB plus CD gives us AD plus CB. That's just the chemical, uh, the formula or the template, we could say, that we use for um, precipitation reactions, okay? So just, you do need to memorize that as well um, because it helps to um, understand what's gonna form the precipitate, okay? So that's basically how that works. Um, now this, you might be thinking, okay, what on earth is this then? This is actually something called the ionic equation, okay? The ionic equation in very simple words, this is the ionic equation. It's the equation or the chemical equation with, oh, sorry, which represents the two or more um, elements, so we could say substances that the precipitate, oh now you can't see anything, hold on, is made of. Okay. Um, why doesn't it come on? Okay. So that's, that's the basic idea. That's what the ionic equation is. So that is basically this. This is the ionic equation, okay? If we look at our, now that might seem confusing, but I'll just try to explain it and make it a little more clear. This is our precipitate in our reaction, yeah? We know that this is our precipitate, number one, because of its position in the equation. But more importantly, and this is the most important point, because our precipitate could be position second as well. That's not so important. 
More than the positioning, it's important to realize that it's got an S next to it, okay? That S stands for solid. Whatever, whatever equation you get, if that's a precipitation equation, whatever element or substance has the bracket S next to it as a state of matter, that is your precipitate, always, okay? Because remember, we said the precipitate is the only substance in the equation that remains behind as an insoluble or undissolvable substance, okay? So we take that, in order to write an ionic equation, there's a few steps involved. Number one, you take the precipitate that you know has formed, you put that as your product, okay? That's your product there. And then you work backwards. So you're gonna now figure out how many, how many um, atoms of, you know, lead and how many atoms of iodide basically make up lead iodide and remember when we write this as individual elements these are actually aqueous in nature because the way that these elements combine to make potassium iodide okay and form a solid doesn't mean that they are individually um, represented as solids by themselves okay so that's basically the idea so when we write an ionic equation it's called ionic because just like an ion has a charge you have to include the charges for the, um, for the elements that are involved here, okay? So that's the basic um, idea there, okay? And when we write this, in this case, we see PB, and then we've got I2. That two, remember, represents two number of atoms of iodine. So then when we write that, we have to put a big two in front like that, okay? Representing two iodine atoms. That's just the way we write the um, ionic equation. Okay, and PB2 plus, we know that it has a two plus charge from looking at that Roman numeral that was attached to it before. Okay, so PB2 plus aqueous, aqueous lead to the solid precipitate forming, which is taken from above. So in a SAC or exam situation, if you're asked to write the ionic equation, you have to first write down the solid, okay, precipitate that's formed, and you take that from your equation above, and then you have to break down which elements, or you have to break that down into then, which elements um, had to combine to make that precipitate um, substance there, okay? This is basically the AD in our solution above, okay? The AD that's there and the AD that's represented in our formula here. Okay, that's a bit of a mess now, um, but basically that's that's really what you need to, um, what you really need to understand. Uh, one more thing that I will just quickly mention before we watch the video is um, when we're talking about ionic equations, we also have something called spectator ions, okay? When we're talking about spectator ions, we're talking about basically any ion that was in the equation that that basically didn't take part. Because guys, what is, can anyone tell me in the chat box, what do we mean by spectator? What does it mean to be a spectator? Just the general English word. Yeah, to just watch or to observe, yeah? So the spectator ions are not actually directly involved in the formation of that precipitate. They just kind of sit back and observe. In this case, the spectator ions are everything except the precipitate. So we're talking about the, um, we're talking about nitrate and we're talking about, um, I, we're talking about nitrate and we're talking about potassium here, okay? So these are basically our spectator ions. They don't actually take part in the, Exper uh, in the sorry, experiment. They don't actually take part in the precipitation reaction. It's only the iodine and the lead ions that have taken part to actually lead to the formation of the precipitate. So spectator ions is everything else that's not associated with the precipitate. Every other element in that equation that is not involved in forming the precipitate. Okay, that's the idea. Okay, a lot of mess here. So let me just get rid of all these drawings now. And then we're going to watch a quick video just demonstrating, and I'll come back to this as well. I just want to show you guys a quick video that demonstrates um, what a precipitate actually looks like. So if I can just get to YouTube, I'll share that screen there. Okay, so let's watch the first one now. Um, how do I make this full screen? No, not that, this one. Okay, so hopefully you guys can see my screen. Yes, okay, so let me just... So this is, um, I'll, I'll just play the video. Where's that button gone? Hold on, I'll just stop the recording as well while we play it. 
So just as I said, um, just as we allow you guys to have a uh, sol sorry a valency table with the charges as well as the periodic table, we also for the chapter four test and for the exam, we actually allow you to have a solubility table. So usually we put that in the test for you. Now the solubility table is good to have because it tells us at a quick glance which items are soluble which items are insoluble and which items are slightly soluble. Now, just testing your definition of what precipitate means, um, would a precipitate come under soluble heading, under the insoluble heading or under the slightly soluble heading? Just write the word that you think. Excellent, yeah. So our precipitate is classified as an insoluble, undissolvable substance. That's why it remains behind as a solid. That means all of these elements or all of these different types of compounds that are listed under the soluble do not form precipitates, okay? Because they are soluble. In other words, they dissolve in solution, okay? They do not form precipitates. All those aqueous solutions that we looked at before, like magnesium, um, you know, magnesium, uh, you know, sulfate, all those things, they generally um, don't form, they generally don't form um, precipitates by themselves, but when combined with another substance, they can. Okay, so they do not form precipitates. Okay. Um, so nitrate salts, um, that's why, for example, um, lead nitrate did not form. Uh, you know, a, um, sorry, that's the reason why lead nitrate by itself in that equation that we looked at before was aqueous in format because it doesn't actually form a precipitate. It is soluble in, by nature, okay, or dissolvable by nature. Insoluble means that these substances here will form a precipitate, will form precipitates. Okay, these will stay behind in the test tube or in the beaker as a solid cloudy substance or will change color or will become a very gloopy jelly-like substance. These will form precipitates, okay? That's why I put a tick there. Slightly soluble are kind of like, kind of yes, kind of no situation. What we mean by that is in order for these compounds to form precipitates, it really depends on factors such as the temperature. Okay, for example, calcium sulfate can form a precipitate, but only if you, for example, heat it up. Okay, you heat it up in, for example, um, a beaker or something like that, it might form a precipitate. So these are dependent on conditions. Okay, dependent on factors. One of those factors is temperature. Another factor could be how long you leave it in the um, beaker or the test tube. So for example, when we did our reactivity of metals practical, remember when the guy did, um, he was looking at the different reactivity of metals and he left some of them for 24 hours and then came back and saw a reaction. Same thing happens with precipitate, um, precipitation reactions as well. Sometimes you leave that test tube or you leave that beaker for a little while and you'll notice that the precipitate substance um, becomes more obvious to see. So whatever substance was forming very lightly has suddenly become a very gloopy or very jelly-like substance after maybe an hour or two hours or after a day. Okay, so dependent on factors like temperature, time, all that stuff. Okay, no clear-cut answer for the third column here or no clear-cut condition. Um, but these ones definitely always form precipitates and these ones definitely do not form precipitates. All right, um, the Snape rule basically suggests that some compounds or some ions are all soluble. That's S for the S in Snape is S for sodium, N, A, P, E. Okay, these are just ions that at a quick glance you can tell that these are soluble using the Snape rule. So these belong in the first column of our solubility table. This is the same table that we generally tend to include in the test as well. So become familiarized with this table. When you're answering questions in your worksheet and stuff, refer back to this table and know how to read this table, know what each of the headings mean. Okay, the first column is do not form precipitates. The second column is these substances do form precipitates. Okay. Um, all right, so that's basically how to read that table there. Um, this is just a worked example of um, what I was talking about before. So again, just another example there, just showing you that sulfate being an example of something that forms a precipitate and how in this case, sodium sulfate forms that precipitate there. Okay, so that's the um, basic idea. Okay. Um, so I just wanna, how can I pause it there? Where? one second. Um, I just want to see. Oh, yes. Uh, 
Okay, I want to pause it at the point where. Okay, anyway, probably can't do that, but it's all right. Um, what I what I want you guys to try to see in that um, GIF is basically um, the kind of, see that little kind of submersion there or that suspension? It's kind of like a white suspension in that blue solution there. That is the um, copper hydroxide. And copper hydroxide in this case um, has led to, um, is the formation of that precipitate there. Okay. Um, what I want you guys to try to do now and I know it's not going to be super easy, but I want you guys to try and write the worded equation for this chemical reaction here. Okay, so I want you to write the worded equation for the chemical reaction. Now, if I can pause it at this point. Okay, it's here. That's the chemical equation. I want you to write this in words. in a proper format. I know some clues are already on the page for you to um, help, help you out with this, but I want you guys to understand how to write this in words. And I want you to understand what these symbols are as well. Okay, for some reason, this equation has stated the um, precipitate as the second product. This isn't wrong, but usually we learn, uh, or according to our formula, uh, we learn that it's like this. It should be A, B plus C, D equals two. AD plus CB. So that's how we usually refer to it. Okay. In this case, the ion represented as A is copper, B is sulfate, C is sodium, D is hydroxide, A is sodium again, D is sulfate. Um, this should be copper and hydroxide. See, according to the way they've written it, um, our, our precipitate is not in the correct position here. So this should probably come, they, these two should swap positions in order to make sure that it matches our equation there. And this is what happens when we get things from the internet. They're not always um, super accurate, but it's okay. It's the same thing at the end of the day. Um, are there any questions so far about this whole formation of precipitation reactions and the formation of uh, precipitates? No, okay. Hopefully this slide um, makes some sense. You can see that copper sulfate plus sodium hydroxide, copper sulfate is here. This is the solution for copper sulfate. Okay, sodium hydroxide is another aqueous solution that is naturally dissolved, okay? It's not insoluble. When you combine those two together, you have a insoluble substance. This little piece of suspension that's kind of lying there, left behind as a solid, undissolvable or insoluble substance is our precipitate. Okay, that was easier to see in that GIF, but it stopped working, so it doesn't matter. Um, this is our precipitate, okay? So in this case, um, our copper hydroxide, which is basically this, is our precipitate. Okay, that's the um, basic idea there. Alrighty, um, we've already discussed this. This is just giving you another example. We've already watched the video about um, the lead iodide precipitate. Remember that very gloopy yellow-like substance that forms? Um, so this is just, again, um, a picture from your book and just giving you a bit of information about that. But we've, I think we've discussed anyway um, the different precipitates that have formed in those examples. So what I'll do is I will just um, go to the next slide. Another example that we can talk about is um, the formation of a precipitate through the interaction between sodium chloride and silver nitrate. Okay, and this then leads to the formation of silver chloride as our precipitate. Okay, what's the one trick, guys, that we talked about? What's the one tip we can use to determine automatically what is the um, precipitate in a precipitation reaction? What's the one clue that we can use? Yeah, excellent. If it's a solid. So we look at our precipitation equation. Okay, that's aqueous, that's aqueous, that's aqueous. This is the only solid. So this is automatically our precip uh, precipitate. Okay, this is the insoluble substance. So even before watching a demonstration of this 
of these two um, substances being mixed together in test tube, we already know that this will be the precipitate that we can expect. And again, this is another example of why knowing the different types of chemical equations or reactions, sorry, can give us a prediction as to what substances or products will be formed. In this case, we automatically know that silver chloride can be expected to form as a precipitate. And silver chloride um, is obviously a type of salt. So that will kind of form as a solid kind of granular, grainy kind of um, solid precipitate there. Okay. Um, so that's the basic um, idea there, okay? Uh, again, it's just the same formula. Sometimes the precipitate is placed as the second product. Again, that's not wrong, um, but I usually prefer it if we place it first because it follows that formula uh, more nicely and more consistently there. Okay, so that's all good. Um, this is another video, again, just showing you another demonstration of um, this particular reaction there. Okay, so that's the, that's the video for that. Um, I don't know why this has repeated again, but this is just the table from before. These are just the ions, so showing you at the particle level or at that very kind of ionic level how these solutions um, are when they're separate compared to how they compared to how they are when they are uh, combined in a solution together. Okay, so you can see here that they are quite separate, but here you've got the um, iodide and the lead ions kind of forming together. Okay, so let me just highlight this. Okay, so here we can see that in this aqueous solution, we've got the lead and the nitrate. So this aqueous solution is representing a lead nitrate. Okay, this uh, next solution here was representing the blue and the yellow um, ions, which are represented as potassium um, iodide. Okay. Sorry, I can't write with this thing. So this is again an aqueous solution, which means that it's dissolved in water, which means that the particles or the ions are mostly separate together. They don't really separate it. They don't really cling to one another or kind of bind to one another. another. When we see the product forming, and this is this whole term, little diagram is showing us the formation of the precipitate. Okay, we can see at the bottom here, we've got a little clump of those um, iodide and lead ions. They're kind of clumped together and they've kind of formed this kind of solid clump at the bottom or solid insoluble substance there, okay? This is what we call as the precipitate. Remember lead iodide was our precipitate. So this is just in a very visual way representing to you what that looks like, okay? Whereas just like before the, um, sorry, the potassium, um, the potassium ions and the nitrate ions, these are what we call as the spectator ions. They are not involved with the precipitate. They're like, we don't want anything to do with you precipitate. Uh, precipitate. We're on our own. We're just sitting back and we're just watching, but we're not involved in the formation of your precipitate there. So that's the basic, um, that's the basic difference. So this is the precipitate. These are the spectator ions. Okay. So that's the um, visual representation of what that looks like. Okay. Um, yeah, and that's about it. So the key notes are that a precipitation reaction involves two soluble ionic solutions that are mixed. These ionic solutions are often dissolvable or they dissolve in solution, okay? That's what soluble means. It means something that's able to be dissolved. And when you mix them, you actually form an insoluble solid substance or solid product, like that yellow gloop we saw in the test tube or that white cloudiness or white grainy particles, something that's left behind in that test tube that's obvious to you, to, uh, that's obvious to see with your eyes, okay? Um, that you don't need like, you know, extra devices or equipment to be able to see. Um, so that's basically a precipitate, okay? The ions that do not take part in that reaction or in the actual precipitate formation of the precipitate are your spectator ions. So just like spectators, uh, spectators at a sports match, they're the ions that sit back and say, we don't want anything to do with the presentation, but we're going to sit back and watch it happen. Okay. And obviously the ions that take part in the formation of that insoluble solid substance are the ions that are involved in the uh, formation of the precipitate. And we can use these ions to write what we call as an ionic equation. Okay, and we looked at that earlier in the spread. And the last thing that we learned today was that we need to be able to understand how to read a solubility table, okay? You don't need to memorize the solubility rules, um, but you do need to be able to interpret that solubility table, the purple one with the three columns, okay? Because 
um, we do give that to you all. We do include that in your SACs and exams as an extra resource with the periodic table and valency table. So if you don't know how to read that, that's not really going to be able to help you in terms of answering questions related to precipitation reactions. So really important to know how to read that, to know what each column is trying to tell us um, so you can refer back to that table. Okay, um, that's 4.5 done. So what I'm going to do is I'll first stop the recording here.